Hi, my name is Brett Martinson. I'm one of the certified financial planning professionals with Parallel Wealth, and I want to talk today about a recent Globe and Mail article about early uh, RIF withdrawals. Uh, some of you may have seen this in the Globe. I want to um, touch on the article and what it says. I want to also get into the underlying report behind the, uh, the article itself and what we do at Parallel Wealth around the information that it's uh, talking about in the article. I'll start by saying that these articles and reports, uh, I believe, are, are great for the industry, financial planning professionals, uh, Canadians in general, because it does provide research and, and provides um, uh, discussion points amongst the industry and amongst the um, planners and and also, obviously, Canadians, and we'll get questions about this type of stuff from our clients every uh, now and then. So we can see here that the, the date of the article from Globe and Mail is uh, May um, uh, 19th, 2023. Why early with RIF withdrawals don't work for most retirees? And we'll get back to that headline in, in a second. A couple things I'll, I'll point out here is that it says here that accelerating RIF withdrawals isn't a great idea in many circumstances. Again, that kind of backs up the, um, the headline here that they don't work with most uh, uh, retirees. It also talks about advisors don't know for certain what tax bracket the clients will be in after retirement, which is absolutely true. Uh, in planning, we work with a lot of um, uh, assumptions and variables, and the tax brackets obviously have, have changed over time. And even if they don't change over time, our circumstances can change which tax bracket we are uh, we are in. Really, if we really dig into it, what kind of projections bother you? So this is the interview they had with Doug uh, Chandler, uh, who um, did the, uh, the research paper. And I often see projections based on a single age of death, uh, life expectancy 87, for example, and uh, and so on. And then that's the that's the extent of the uh, the article that the um, the interview has been edited and and condensed. So some good information in there. But if we actually go into the paper itself, so this is the actual paper. We'll put some links in the YouTube description in terms of how to get to these uh, uh, various papers. I can um, just quickly show you that this is the Financial Planning Canada's uh, Research Foundation page. And this is the Research and Resource section. And we find all this information uh, right here. First of all, we'll note that the paper is actually titled Retirement Drawdown Choices. Uh, where the uh, the uh, article itself, the, the title was um, Why Early Rift, Rift Withdrawals Don't Work for Most re, uh, Retirees. In the report itself, and I'm not going to go through the entire uh, uh, report, it is uh, pretty lengthy. I do encourage especially, obviously, financial planners and advisors to read it, so we're not just pulling sound bites um, uh, from it. But if if we dig into the report itself, it's really interesting, a couple of... Um, uh, spots in the report. Uh, for example, if, if we go all the way down to uh, the conclusions, it uh, doesn't necessarily say that don't accelerate RIF withdrawals, but don't assume that it, it's uh, the best set and forget option, meaning we put a plan in place and then we monitor that plan over um, over time. And, and uh, uh, Doug actually states in the, in the report that monitoring the strategy and the plan in general is, um, is uh, key. So in my mind, it's not so much that early withdrawals are bad. It's just making the assumption that we should be doing early withdrawals and A, not looking at uh, other scenarios or comparing those scenarios. Uh, as Doug talked about once again in the article here of, of just doing one, one projection based on a single age of death these type of things. So it's not necessarily that the early withdrawals are, are an issue. It's how we are getting that information and what are we comparing that information uh, to. For example, speaking from, from our experience, what we do with at Parallel Wealth is we do a number of different scenarios. We start with a base case, uh, which is uh, we sometimes call the default case, which is uh, the client's information in the planning software, with no financial planning or tax planning added to it. And, and just, we're looking at what that client is on track for, which is actually one of the practice standards for um, uh, certified financial uh, planners. One of the practice standards is looking at the fact of where is this client headed without any changes? And then we start applying 
some of the changes that we're looking for, uh, whether we defer CPP or not, and, and to what age, possibly even whether we defer OAS. And then obviously within our RSP meltdown, when do we start taking um, withdrawals out? Interestingly enough, I had a client just recently where I had recommended that they defer taking RSP, RIF, and uh, locked-in account withdrawals until much later in the plan. Now, this was a very specific situation in that they had a relatively large non-registered investment account, which was creating a lot of uh, taxation. And we looked at different options in terms of what to do with that um, account, leave it as is, uh, uh, do a prescribed interest rate loan to, to children, move it into a trust. Uh, neither of these ideas were necessarily right or wrong or better or worse. It was just options to look at that. So when we're looking at various plans, we are, or various scenarios, we are tracking our numbers and identifying how much projected tax is being paid in any given one scenario. As Doug says, there are things into the future that we don't know about. Absolutely. And that is why, again, Doug stresses the fact that this is not a set and forget for the next 15 years, but a um, an idea that it should be monitored because a few years down the road or five years down the road, the recommend recommendations could be different. Just as if somebody had a financial plan done five years ago and then came for an update today, there's a possibility that the recommendations will um, will absolutely be different. Last thing I want to touch on about these um, articles and reports and stuff like that, and I already touched on a little bit, is the sound bites that they can um, uh, they can create. I recognize that headlines are what grab us and what has us uh, looking into the article and reading it. And let's be honest, media exists out there to be consumed, and I understand that. So when I go and look at the report itself, and the title is Re Retirement Drawdown Choices, and as we read through it and understand that what Doug is saying is that no one methodology is best for everybody, then it's very um, challenging, I guess, that sometimes what we what we see is is a headline like this which then makes us assume that we should not be doing riff, riff withdrawals early for most canadians which is essentially what this uh is saying there was an article or a report in uh, december 2020 getting the most uh from uh canadian quebec pension plans by delaying benefits and again, about a 72-page report, and it ended up having quite a few sound bites throughout uh, the various media. I saw people uh, uh, referring to the article, uh, planners and advisors referring to the articles and how people are leaving hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table, which is a point made in that uh, document. But if the document is to be read in its entirety, that was not necessarily the only result that came out of the document. There was a lot of, if this, then consider that. If that, then consider uh, this. So I just wanted to make a, a point after going through the article and the report, just to indicate that we've, we've got to stand back a little bit. Uh, I'm hoping advisors and planners are actually reading these reports before they um, uh, reference them and uh, discuss them rather than just grabbing um, uh, sound bites and such. And when working with a, an advisor or planner, I would be asking them uh, how many uh, scenarios they ran. It's not a question of that they ran 500 scenarios. It's, it's not more is better. But if it's just one report that says, if you take out X amount of money, uh, and here's what you're left with, you'll be good, that in itself may not be, I would argue, enough, as opposed to a report that says, look, we looked at this and this and this, and here were the uh, benefits or downsides uh, to uh, these various scenarios, and based on your goals and what you want to accomplish, we're going to recommend that you do this, this, and this. And then there's a discussion around that, and maybe the client ends up tweaking things a little bit and saying, well, I like this, but I don't want to compromise that. And that's what a financial plan ultimately becomes, in my opinion, is a compromise between what is possible and the goals the client wants to achieve.